manage the crisis, but focus on that future because that's where your opportunities are. Solutions from the past and then a desire to return to the old status quo is not the way that, that we have to look forward. And Hi, everyone. This is Dana Lewis, and welcome to another edition of Backstory. In this edition, Leadership in Crisis, and we surely have a crisis that's being compared to challenges in war, a world pandemic crippling economies, devastating businesses big and small. Now, I've covered a few wars in Iraq and in Afghanistan, and as a reporter for American TV, I was embedded with the 101st Airborne Division in both those war zones. And I was amazed at commanders' abilities to organize, execute, and reconfigure battle plans on massive and ever-changing battlefields, to work through a crisis no matter how daunting while under fire. Now, fast forward 20 years later, and it's no surprise, big corporations employ those ex-commanders. Call in the airborne cavalry, cowboys over a rock, now transform from the battlefield to the boardroom because they are remarkable leaders who can see through the fog of war, even a war against a pandemic. If you're running a business, how do you plan and pave the road forward? Let's listen. All right, joining me now is Jeff Schlosser, the Executive Vice President of Bell Helicopters. Jeff is a retired Major General with a distinguished 34-year military career to include commanding the 101st Airborne in Iraq and also in Afghanistan. And Jeff was Deputy Director of the National Counterterrorism Center and was the first director uh, of the War on Terror Planning Office within the Department of Defense following 9-11. Hi, Jeff. Hey, how are you today, Dana? Very well. And we'll say hello also to Jimmy Blackman, the author of Pale Horse, Hunting Terrorists in Afghanistan, and most recently the book Cowboys Over Iraq. And I love that title. It's about leadership in the airborne cav over Iraq. Jimmy is a combat veteran and he lectures extensively and is very valued on any topic on leadership. Jeff, first over to you. I mean, we're in a crisis like no other. It is surely a time for toughness and true grit and guts and resolve, uh, but it's also a very important time to be sober uh, and wise about surviving this from a business perspective. Would you agree? I totally agree, to you, Dana. Right now, the tendency for business leaders is to focus on the crisis, and, and you get into a tactical mode just trying to manage it. In fact, what leaders have to also do is, is try to understand what is the future opportunities and challenges and then plan for that future, and it takes a balance. And a very difficult balance. Jimmy, I know you're a gutsy guy. You're a combat vet of the skies, and uh, you know, what are you telling business leaders and professionals right about now? Yeah, so the challenge has been um, they're having to lead remotely now. Uh, one, of, one of the big challenges is how they communicate, prioritize, and focus their people uh, when they can't huddle them in a room necessarily. Uh, it's amazing how many people have become proficient using uh, virtual means such as this now out of necessity. Of course, uh, you know, a crisis like this forces us to learn a lot about ourselves and, and businesses are learning a lot about themselves and leaders and how they uh, can connect and align their folks uh, while not being able to huddle them up necessarily. So um, over communicating and being very clear and specific and priorities, uh, not just today and how they're, they're handy, handling the day to day. Uh, priorities in their business, but uh, how they're going to emerge from this and seeking to uh, leverage uh, opportunities. As a news correspondent, I mean, I was in Afghanistan, uh, you know, probably a couple dozen times. And probably the, one of the highlights for me is flying in a Black Hawk helicopter with you, Jeff, uh, over areas of peace, but also of war. And uh, we talked about the surge in violence and the Taliban attacking all over the country. You had how many soldiers under you then? So uh, when we started about 25,000 and when we left 37,000, and as you recall, I, I went and bet my stars and said, we needed more resources uh, in spite of uh, Iraq ongoing. And uh, we got them from uh, the administration. The, the pressure, if you can compare it to what people are going through today, I must have been enormous. Did you just soldier on uh, or do you keep adapting strategy and, and to a rapidly changing and complex problem, much like a pandemic now? Yeah, so exactly the point, Dana. So we would soldier on and I would have a, a small group, we call it a current operations, and Jimmy knows this well, that would focus on what happened that day and then what, how would it change that week. 
But I also had a team that was focused on what we call future planning and future operations. And I met with them all the time to try to understand what we were going to do in the coming couple of weeks. It's critical that business do, does that same type of thing. In other words, manage the crisis, but focus on that future because that's where your opportunities are. But it's also where you can really screw up if you don't make uh, uh, decent plans for it. Jimmy, you were also there in, in Jalalabad, I understand, close to the Pak border, the Pakistan border. And is there some parallel to flying combat missions and fighting now a virus that is grinding nations into financial ruin and killing people? Well, I think the ever-changing situation um, is, is a, a common theme. The, you know, the, they're calling this the age of disruption and, uh, and our business battlefield. It, it's the rate of change that seems to be so different. You know, if you could humor me for just one second, knowing we were going to do this, I went and looked this up because it, um, Jeff and I have had opportunity to discuss this in, in December uh, not this specific, but this topic, and, and I, this kept coming back to me in December of 1862, uh, Abraham Lincoln wrote a letter to Congress, and this is just a couple of sentences from that. He said, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. And I think this time is demanding that leaders think in a new way, address problems in a new in a new way, perhaps the solutions from the past, and a desire to return to the old status quo is not the way that, that we have to look forward. And so I'm encouraging guys to think of, you know, Einstein, uh, we, we don't solve our problems with the same way of thinking that created them, we, we have to think anew. Jeff, you're at Bell. Um, you you yeah. sell military and civilian helicopters all, all over the world, including China. Um, has your model, business model just flipped upside down? And then when you listen to Jimmy about, okay, you know, weathering a new storm and doing everything anew, I mean, in practical, that, that sounds great philosophically, but in practical terms, how, how do you implement something like where you just, start your business almost from scratch and yet not. You're still selling helicopters. Yeah, so that's a great question, Dana. So uh, let me give you a solid example. One of the things that we found out is, is that uh, over the last two months, uh, by working remotely, I call it a distributed workforce. In other words, distributed, we, we're distributed globally. But I like we, that. Yeah, but after we found that uh, there are certain categories of our business where the productivity has actually gone up by a significant factor, right? So now we've got to embrace that. Uh, you know, generally speaking, we're not a company that would love to have people not work, I mean, not work together. We, you know, and generally we would keep them, uh, you know, at our workplaces, but in fact, we're reevaluating where does productivity really uh, get enhanced uh, by working, you know, in a distributed way. That's just one single way of taking a hard look at what we've been challenged and say, you know what? We can save money on facilities. We can save money on a whole variety of other, other capabilities. But you must still scratch your head at the end of the day, all of you. And I know that there, there are some pretty big thinkers at Bell and some smart people. I mean, strategically, how in the world do you navigate all of this? For instance, you manufacture in China, don't you? Well, we do actually, we sell in China and we train in China. So uh, we're not involved in the defense community there in China, but we have helped establish their emer emergency medical service uh, flight capability. And we, to do that, we, it was basically a green field, Dan. We had to go on in and we actually said, we got to train helicopter pilots because they didn't have any. And so we started a training academy there in China. And... Uh, there's no doubt that in the future that we'll be doing, you know, production potentially in, in, in that country uh, as long as relationships will remain. But, but you're absolutely right that, I mean, you know, you have to grab hold of these opportunities. And so there's other things out there that we're going to be, you know, uh, saying, you know what, Bell can do this. And this is giving us an opportunity to get inside that kind of uh, either a new field or a, uh, a new capability. I mean, you, you know, there, there's crisis management for you, right? In just about every company, in every country right now. Could you, you lecture on five steps of crisis management? Can you just kind of very briefly hit the headlines? 
Yeah, well, the, the crisis management, uh, really, that model came about from the, the tactical need. Uh, and, and the model I used was one that we had in Afghanistan in 2000 time, where we oftentimes had multiple crises simultaneously going on. And, um, and so when we, you know, who needs to be there? What are the roles? What tools do you use in order to manage the current crisis? Of course, this is all tactical. And then how do you maximize uh, the resources that you have, prioritizing a limited amount of resources? Very few companies have unlimited resources. And so uh, that kind of drove that model. But if I could just hit on something that uh, General Slosher said there, you know, uh, ideally suited to handle these types of situations with distributed uh, workforce. I mean, uh, his headquarters was in Bagram. Um, he had forces all over the country, and, and of course, we were there uh, together uh, for a period of time in both Iraq and Afghanistan. I was one of his squadron commanders, and there were times we did air assault operations into Kunar province where we planned and, re and, and briefed the mission using virtual means, a video teleconference, and I literally picked soldiers up from four or five different combat outposts to bring together on one mission with one objective. We planned that, we rehearsed it, we did everything distributed and, and was quite successful in operations. And so uh, we got a lot of military folks out there that have experienced this. It just wasn't in business necessarily, but the same concept. Yeah, yeah, Dan, I just wanted to pick up on what Jimmy said. You know, when I reflect back on those times in Afghanistan, just as, as, as Jimmy was laying out, you know, one of the things that senior leaders actually have to do in these in these crisis moments is is if you're going to be able to if you really try to embrace this idea of distributed operations and you know right now you end up you don't have a choice so you better embrace it uh what you have to do is empower and then resource you know and, and so empowerment you know what i would do is i would initially establish you know a a basically a line of intent between, like say, Jimmy, who was a squadron commander in a really our toughest place. Uh, and I would go visit him, meet with his staff. He had a great intelligence staff and, and great operations. And of course, Jimmy's a very wise com combat commander. But I would get inside his brain, he'd get inside mine. But then after that, I had to empower him. And it was very uncomfortable sometimes because we placed him in some really tough, tough situations. But you have to empower, and then you've got to make sure they have the resources. Here's something that puzzled me, because you invited me uh, into Bagram Air Base, which was a former Soviet air base for people who haven't been to Afghanistan. It's a former Soviet air base. It was taken over uh, by, by the uh, American forces after 9-11. Uh, huge, sprawling air base. But in it, you have uh, something called the bridge. And it's a little bit like the Starship Enterprise. And... You walk in there and there are all these monitors everywhere and you see drone feeds and there are incoming <laughs> calls. And I know, sir, you were taking all, all kinds of calls from people out and, and doing checkups and finding out what was going on on the ground. And, and you know, you, you, you did give me the tour and say it was an amazing way of keeping in touch and understanding the battlefield and what was going on. And yet a, a colonel leaned over to me when I was sitting there and he said, you know, if you spend enough time in this room, much like a much like a Zoom, a, a much more sophisticated Zoom. But if you spend th that much time in a room like this, you actually think you know what's going on. So there's a little bit of danger in all this technical meeting, isn't there? There absolutely is, Dan. And if you recall when we were together, so I took you to the bridge, and I took you to it's a joint operations center. And you know, actually, we have similar things here in business. You know, where we manage crises in a crisis room. But the big danger, as you said, and what and how I elaborated with that is I said, let's go fly. And we went up and we flew in a place called Capisa, which can be on again and off again, fairly dangerous, um, up to see soldiers in our French troops as well as our special operations troops. What you have to do is have the combination of have your, your staff inside the bridge or the Joint Operations Center helping you to understand that, that you know, what looks to be the situation but double check, get on the ground. And virtually, as Jimmy's pointed out, that can be challenging. And so now's the time to pick up the phone after you do your Zoom meeting or your web meeting with 15 or 20 people, pick up the phone and check and check on Jeff Schlosser and say, hey, Jeff, what's actually happening in your location? Tell me, no doubt, you know, low down, just tell me what's going on. 
and have that kind of mutual kind of a trusting conversation. And that's going to be that's very critical advice, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that, that's how we're going to get through this, I think, you know. And, and Jimmy, you know, one of the things that you I think you lecture about and and uh, it is not unique to your crisis management ideas. I mean, I think every uh, every unit, whether it's uh, a tactical command center, you know, for a, a colonel or a captain or you head on up to generals. The biggest thing that I saw with the U.S. Army, unlike any other army, and I've embedded as a reporter with lots of them, including the Russian army, and I, which is an altogether different experience. And that is that this after action that takes place after a mission or after something has taken place where you get together and you very quickly, it doesn't go on for hours, but you very quickly say, what do we get right? And more importantly, what do we get wrong? And Anybody can talk in that meeting, as far as I understand, and th they can challenge a superior. And the idea is to be honest about it and to move forward and learn. Absolutely. I mean, that's how learning growing organizations thrive. Um, as you said, you have to, you know, take the rank off and have thick skin, kind of the ground rules up front, because that's how we learn and grow. And, you know, a, a method that I like to use and all the ones that I facilitated was I would go to the restroom and look in the mirror before we started and say, what did I do to fail my soldiers or this organization? You know, maybe I made a decision prematurely that led to other subsequent uh, decisions and that I didn't need to make it then or maybe I didn't resource or prepare someone appropriately and I found that when a leader's vulnerable up front and owns mistakes it opens the door for others to stand up and say you know I could have done this better and, and you're, you're right a lot of a lot of organizations businesses do it when something goes catastrophically wrong but we should be doing it when things go well so we develop new best practices as well Jeff, you were a major general and you had a lot of people serving under you. Does it get difficult to park your ego at the door and have that conversation? <laughs> Dana, you're probably absolutely right. Uh, the truth is, is if, if you do an AER and, you know, I've done many both in business, but clearly in combat, if it doesn't hurt and it doesn't nudge you a little bit, then you're probably not getting an honest, uh, you know, assessment of, of your own performance. I mean, you know, uh, I came up, uh, as Jimmy knows, uh, in, uh, you know, started off in Air Cavalry and then eventually, uh, actually I started up blowing stuff up as a combat engineer, then Air Cavalry, and then the, the 160th Special Operations, who has, they have a reputation of just giving brutal AERs where the youngest soldier can turn around and say, you know what, sir, you really screwed this decision up, and this is the impact that it had on the rest of the mission. And uh, we took that into the 101st and, and uh, the, all the outfits. Guys like Jimmy had it already in, in his, uh, you know, uh, background. And absolutely, you've got to park your ego at the door or in the bathroom, as Jimmy said, and, and really encourage uh, honest assessment. Sometimes people are not going to give it to you unless you prod them, unless you really say, you know what, I know I made a mistake. Here's the mistake. And the people will eventually try to pile on. And you can eventually learn from that um, a significant amount that will help your business. If I could just add to that, because it's come up a couple of times and things that uh, General Slosher has said, it's important to have that person around you that'll tell the king when he's naked. Uh, I fought for uh, what would be my COO, my S3, going as a brigade commander in Afghanistan. If it wasn't for General John Campbell, I wouldn't have got him out of a fellowship in time. But I wanted him specifically because of, of the, his candidness with me. Um, I knew that he would tell me what I needed to hear, not what I wanted to hear. And what a lot of companies are finding out in this crisis right now is who's truly important in their organization, what positions right now. And a lot of, a lot of bosses, quite frankly, are, I think are being surprised at how little they matter, how their companies are really running in their absence very well. But we're seeing some of these key positions in companies emerge as vitally important. So then the question has to become, do I have the right talent leveraged against that position with the right resources and the right guidance? And, uh, and so that, that's a, a very strategic way of thinking, of, of really looking at your business, uh, both in the tactical and the future plans, as, as General Slosher mentioned earlier. What are those vital positions and are the right people in the right seat on the bus with the right portfolio, as Jim Collins would tell us? That's critical. If you're talking about the right people, then the right leaders 
what do, what should leaders be doing right now? I mean, I've, I've heard things like, you know, big ideas and strategy, communicate that through the organization, overseeing implementation of big ideas. Uh, but big ideas have to be open to drastically upending uh, the classic business model right now. It's, it's, you need a lot of courage right now in business. Yeah, let me file on that right now, Dan. I would say that, uh, you know, one thing to pick up on is, is that um, when you're communicating, you're not just communicating, you know, life is normal or, hey, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about where we're at. You've basically got to be calm and reassuring in, in times in which, you know, the chaos and crises really have, you know, made upended people's lives. And you have to understand that privately their lives are also upended, not just their business lives. Absolutely. To, to do that. The big ideas, as we're talking about, some of them are actually internal. So, I mean, you pointed out, and so did Jimmy, you know, this, you actually have an opportunity to identify some of your best crisis leaders. Uh, not all of them will always be leaders. You know, I, uh, let me take the example that in, in combat, you could find some natural born or learned leaders that were awesome in combat. If you took them back to the garrison into a peacetime environment, they were usually bored or maybe they were not as effective. I know Jimmy's written about a couple of those guys that we know that are close friends of ours. Um, you're going to have that same opportunity here in business to identify those, those leaders right now that can lead in a crisis. And you need to make sure that you understand what you're seeing and then be able to place them in positions where they'll be able to excel as we, as we move out of this pandemic. There are, there are positions, by the way, that where people who can do that uh, in pandemics can also operate very effectively uh, in normal times. But you have to be careful. It's, yeah, just it's, it's very down. tough moving moving those people around though and making decisions that are affecting people's lives right now when they're already, as you say, under enormous personal pressure. Yeah, you know, I uh, I was coaching an executive of a large company and um, he had a direct report that had a lot of responsibility and uh, and he was struggling, quite frankly, prior to, to the crisis. And uh, he said, I, I want you to coach him as well. And we got into the point where um, I was unsure if he was going to be the right fit uh, for the long run uh, in this position. I, I, I did not think he had the talent and the and the skill set to do the job. And this crisis happened, and all I've heard are these raving reports from from his boss about how he's just thriving in this crisis. And and I reminded him of of the same thing Joel Slosher mentioned. There were guys that that I was, you know, before we went to combat, I was uncertain. I kind of, the hair on my neck would stand up, you know, when I'd give them a mission. And there were folks that I had, I was certain would be my rock stars that I got over there and I was a bit disappointed. So sometimes, uh, you know, it, it is the right, you know, the right environment uh, that brings out the best in them. How do you keep good people right now? Yeah, I'll start off with that. And so right now with the best, your best people, are the, or the good people that have you know been that bubbled here to the top. You've got to give them a lot of responsibility and then empower them, um, and they will help your business. But at the end of the day, you're also helping them personally, and uh, because that's how they're going to thrive. Um, these this distributed workplace that we have, the remote working. You know, where people are working, especially if they're working from their homes in a singular way, and yet they're leaders. If they're natural leaders, they're going to feel very uncomfortable. It's extraordinarily hard to lead via Zoom or WebEx. It can be done. But, uh, you know, again, they're going to be uncomfortable. And so what you've got to do is you've got to encourage them, talk to them individually. Not, I mean, you know, again, this is like talking to a formation when you use a WebEx in, in the military time terms. In other words, it is a way of indirect leadership where I'm talking to a large number of people. You now have got to be able to, as a leader, pick up that phone uh, and, and say, hey, hey, Dana, how are you doing today? Let's talk about, let's talk about your family for two or three minutes. Everything going okay? And then transition into what your responsibilities are and, and how can I help you do that job better? And it's reaching out like that, I think, in a singular way. It's kind of like my battlefield circulation or what Jimmy did on the battlefield as well. So you have to go check on those troops wherever they're at and see what their perspective is and then bring that on back to your headquarters. How do you get back up off the ground in this, you know, horrible economic climate. A lot of people are going to lose jobs and they're losing them right now. Take this down, just not from the big business executive, but right down uh, to a frontline worker 
uh, or maybe a secondary from the front line who is suddenly going to get laid off, or is he's not going to get he or she is not going to get reemployed. And you guys have had long careers, and you've you've I'm sure always looked far forward and wanted to advance and wanted to get promoted. When it took a right hand turn, what kind of kept you going? And can I ask both of you that, Jeff? Maybe you want to start. Sure. The first thing I think is, is one is being human enough to understand that you've got to have some empathy with everybody that's inside your organization, including those that look like you may just had to furlough somebody and it, and it bothers you, it hurts you in the gut. Um, and I had situations like that, both in business as well as also in the, in the military. It absolutely hurts. Try to try to put yourself in their shoes and understand it from that, that viewpoint. And then do what you can to try to mitigate or to help uh, as best as you possibly can. Through the rest of the workforce that you have currently ongoing and stuff like that, they're going to look and they're going to see, you know, the people that are actually either furloughed, they've lost their jobs, their friends or relatives or whatever. And they're going to bring that into the workspace. And you're going to have to be able to talk about it. I mean, you're going to have to talk about it in an open way. I mean, what I've actually seen is, is that on our plant floors, our productivity is actually going up. People are happy to have a job. Uh, we're doing our best to take care of them in a variety of different ways that you'd expect, you know, safe health, health practices and stuff like that. And they're bringing that on and they're working harder. Um, you know, they're just happy to, to be employed by a good employer. Yeah. Jimmy? You know, I think the, the first thing I think of is good people are always in demand. Um, good people are always, um, most of them that know they're good and they're talented, uh, are confident that, um, it, they'll get, they'll get a job somewhere, they'll go somewhere, but this evolution, this change is inevitable. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing, I, I think we're certainly going to see a commercial real estate crisis here because companies, uh, as Jeff mentioned, when we first started, they're, they're figuring out that not everyone has to be in brick and mortar. Not everyone has to have an office with a, a desk and, and a chair. And so we're going to see a, an evolution. But look, we're constantly evolving and changing and we figure it out. I mean, uh, it, by 2016, our economy was 80.9% uh, services. We transitioned from a manufacturing economy to a services economy. And jobs changed. People were replaced with automation. But people adapted and other jobs were created. And, and I think as leaders, we have to provide that positive outlook that, that yeah, it may look different. This new normal uh, may be one that, that looks very different than it does today, um, but, but we've, we've been going through this. The pace has just been uh, increased uh, with this pandemic. Uh, again, I would be optimistic and looking for opportunity, uh, not uh, focusing on the crisis that's in our face. I heard something very interesting today, in fact, a statistic on Georgia opening up and that only 6% uh, of their business had come back to a lot of the restaurants and that kind of thing. General Petraeus, uh, who you both served with in the 101st Airborne and who I know just did a lecture at the London School of Economics, and I was struck by something he said, and I'd like to have your opinion on it. Because there is a, a divisive uh, debate in America and here in the United Kingdom and all across Europe and, and elsewhere in the world. You're either saying, we got to stay at home longer, we've got to ride it out, or let's run hot, let's open it up. And, and uh, General Petraeus said, look, they should not be competing notions. Uh, because if you have health, you have confidence, and your employees won't return and your customers won't return unless you build confidence. So you shouldn't have to choose between your personal health and your financial health. Jeff, you just mentioned on your assembly line um, that your workers, obviously, you've gone out of your way to make them feel confident that they can return. Right. And so, I mean, I, I think uh, it's a great point that, uh, you know, first and foremost, what you should be doing, I think, in the industries, including the service sector, including rest, uh, the hospitality industry, is one, making sure that your workforce is, in fact, protected and they feel, uh, not just feel, but are, in fact, uh, you know, treated in a way that uh, allows them to maximize their health. Um, you know, that, that can go from everything, for, for example, in our uh, production lines, where when people come to work, all shifts, Basically, we shoot their temperature, you know, in a non-intrusive way. And if it's above 100.4, um, 
uh, we actually bring them off on the side. They talk to a health provider. They do it again at 15 minutes. And if it still is that high, we advise them to go home and, and we go through a, uh, a, a whole quarantine procedure. We don't have to do that inside of a restaurant, but what you do, do need to do is take care of your workforce first and foremost. If they feel taken care of, then you can concentrate on your customers. And then the customer is the next part. You know, how do you make a customer feel like it's actually going to be healthy to go and partake in a service, so such as going to a restaurant and things of that nature? You've got to basically think about that kind of, how do you re restructure your infrastructure, tables, everything like that? How do you maximize the way that people can still have a good time, have you know a good meal, and yet at the same time feel healthy and be healthy you know, from it? It's a challenge, but it can be done. And uh, and I don't see it as a either or. You know, I'm, um, you know, I mean, there's clearly going to be some industries that are going to be challenged for the next four, or five, maybe more years, and some may not come out the same way. They may come out very differently than what they were prior to this pandemic. But I'm still an optimist that, you know, business as it goes and, uh, in the UK, in the United States, throughout the world, is going to have to continue on throughout this pandemic. They can't stop. Jimmy, do you want to take, do you want to take a prediction on where we are in the next year or two years, how this ends or how it doesn't end at all? Well, um, <laughs> I listen to the same news feeds you do, and and I, you know, we're certainly not going to have. We'll have a vaccine in record time, not in the near future. And uh, I, you know, I'm an advocate of being smart, but trying to get the economy back going as fast as possible. You know, four four instruments of national power: diplomatic, informational, military, and economic. And uh, from a U.S. Uh, strategic standpoint, our economy is everything. That that's that drives everything for us. Uh, so uh, I, I think that engine needs to get started, not just from a uh, from a business standpoint, as in a personal business owner, but also the economy's importance to our nation and and the global power. Um, I I also think that it's hard for for each of us to to truly understand perspective. Um, and for General Petraeus is, is speaking, uh, you know, a mentor of mine, a great friend, but he's speaking from his perspective. And and I don't know how I would feel if I owned a restaurant right now and I was told I couldn't open it and I was struggling to pay the power bill. Or I had employees calling me that were trying to figure out how to get on unemployment uh, or maybe couldn't. That That's a very different feeling. And so, uh, I, you know, my heart goes out to those small business owners that are in a position where they're seeing maybe their life's work vanish in front of their eyes and they're desperate uh, to try and get things back going. You know, all very well and good to say stay positive, but I mean, this is the toughest environment that we've probably ever seen uh, apart from, you know, a world war. All right, Jeff Schlosser, the executive vice president of Bell Helicopters, major general, retired. Uh, and Jimmy Blackman is the author of Cowboys Over a Rock. It's a great book. I just went through it the other night and uh, definitely worth reading from a leadership point of view, as well as a great insight into adventure. Th thank you both so much for your time and expertise. Great to be with you Thanks, today. Dan. Thank you. And that's this edition of Backstory on Leadership in a Crisis. Please sign up to our podcast to listen to past and future episodes. And if you like Backstory Podcast, please let others know where to find it. I'm Dana Lewis.